Okay, great. Yeah, Th thanks, Caitlin, a lot for the introduction and for the invitation. It's really exciting uh, to be in this uh, wonderful seminar series. So yeah, so as Caitlin was explaining at the beginning, so my, basically in my lab we're interested in, in using single molecule techniques, single molecule for spectroscopy techniques to study protein dynamics under force, and in particular we're interested in focal adhesion proteins or proteins that have some kind of mechanosensing, let's say, uh, function in the cell. And, and today I'm going to be speaking about two different stories that are related to two different quite important focal adhesion proteins where I, I hope I'll be able to demonstrate how I believe like useful single molecule techniques are to understand the function of these proteins. So but the, before I start with the projects, I always like to uh, you know, devote a few, a few slides to kind of motivate the problem and, and try to convince you that actually mechanical forces are important in biology. So in, in biology, typically people have studied traditionally the role of chemical signaling or electrical signaling, but now we understand that also mechanical forces are a crucial cellular cue. And now we have many, many examples, but I've chosen like three different examples that I, I think they are quite intuitive that, and that, and that uh, demonstrate this. Um, pretty well. So, first example that you're seeing here are some experiments um, from the um, Roca Cusat lab in Barcelona, where basically what you're seeing it's mouse fibroblast plated on substrate of different stiffness. So, basically, you have here up like a very um, soft substrate and here a very stiff substrate, and right away you can see how the stiffness of the substrate influences. Uh, quite dramatically uh, cellular morphology, you know? As you increase the stiffness of substrate, cells like to spread, so they are actually able to sense these mechanical properties and adapt to it. Uh, in a similar way, cell migration can also be dicta uh, dictated by the mechanical properties of, of the substrate, uh, and this is also some beautiful experiment from the Xavi Trapat lab, where what you have here is a gel that has a gradient of stiffness, so it's very soft to the left and very stiff to the right, and I don't know if you can see, like cells like to preferentially move, so basically they like confine cells here and then they let them migrate, and as you can see, like cells like to migrate following the gradient of a stiffness, so basically they like to move towards the stiffer regions. That's a phenomenon that it's known as durotaxis. And even like more sophisticated, uh, let's say, biological processes such as the differentiation can also be uh, regulated by the mechanical properties of the cellular matrix. So this is some uh, beautiful work from the Dennis Ditcher lab, where basically they took stem cells and plated them in substrates of different stiffnesses, mimicking the mechanical properties of different tissues in our body. So here are really very, very soft gel with a stiffness similar to that of the brain, which is the softest tissue in our body. And as you can see, these stem cells, after a few days, they differentiate in a particular way here, adopting this kind of branch structure that is very characteristic of, of neurons. However, when these stem cells were uh, plated on a substrate of intermediate stiffness, similar to the stiffness of the muscle, they adopted a totally different shape and they differentiate uh, into a totally different um, cell type, adopting like this striated um, morphology similar to that of myoblast. And finally, on very stiff gels, similar to the um, stiffness of the bone, they adopt um, this um, different shape, similar to that of osteoblast. So all these three examples, the thing that has in common is that there's like, in principle, like no chemical signaling, no electrical signaling, it's only the uh, mechanical properties or the physical properties of the substrate what uh, guides, let's say, these different cellular processes. And I'm interested in trying to understand uh, this from a molecular perspective, so basically the proteins that are involved in these force sensing um, processes, how do they work, how they are able to sense these forces and respond to them. So let's start with a very simple cartoon no? uh, of how a cell attaches to, to this extracellular matrix and what are some of the main molecular players. So cells attach to the extracellular matrix by forming what's called focal adhesions, which are large uh, macromolecular, let's say, complexes, highly dynamic, that, however, have some kind of main players. One of them are integrins, which are uh, the extracellular receptors that bind to d different ligands in the extracellular matrix, in proteins in the extracellular matrix. And here on the cytoplasmic side, we have one of the most, let's say, important proteins in focal adhesions, which is tailin, which is a protein that acts as a cross-linker by binding to the uh, cytosolic uh, integrin tails and also to, also to actin filaments. And therefore, uh, this establishes like this kind of protein chain that connects the cell effectively uh, from the extracellular matrix down to the nucleus. So as this force increases, these proteins are mechanically stretched, both by the forces transmitted from the, from the cellular environment, but also from the, from the actomyosin uh, machinery, and these proteins can undergo conformational changes, 
and therefore that uh, regulates, for example, the recruitment of new po uh, protein partners, for example, like vinculin, that uh, enhance this forced transmission that will eventually develop into some kind of signaling event, for example, the regulation of, um, of uh, mechanosensing transcription factors, and that is the way, let's say, the cell will be able to interpret these forces and adapt to them. So here, I mean, the way I like to picture these processes is that what we have, in a way, it's kind of a problem of languages. No, because in principle cells are not able to speak, let's say, the, 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 the mechanics language or they are not able to speak physics, they speak biochemistry. No, so here we need some kind of interpreter that is able to understand four signals and convert them into a biochemical signal that the cell can actually understand. And these uh, proteins are what in general known as uh, force sensing or mechanosensing proteins, the ones that are able to you know, make this conversion between mechanics and, and biochemistry. So how does this work? I mean, what kind of molecular mechanisms can we have um, in this context? So imagine that, you know, at the beginning you have a protein, for example, like tailing, that it's uh, exposed to, you know, to low forces. So under low forces, proteins will be able to maintain its, its, its structural integrity. They will, you know, be able to remain folded. And for example, that might allow some other protein binder to interact with a site that is exposed, you know, on the protein structure like this uh, purple uh, binder that I'm showing you here. However, as, as I was saying before, as forces increases, uh, this might trigger conformational change in proteins, and that might include the folding of some protein domain. Now, obviously, you will lose this initial uh, exposed binding site, and that therefore this purple binder, you know, will basically go out. But at the same time, when you unfold a protein, what you're doing, you're also exposing previously cryptic uh, um, sites that before were buried on the protein structure, but now they're exposed. So actually, force can create new binding sites for a new protein uh, to interact with them. So in this sense here, what we have is, if you, know, if you have the purple binder, let's say, bound to the protein, that means that we have low forces. Well, if you have the orange binder, that means that you have high force. So this is like a way of, of, of converting, let's say, uh, mechanical forces into, into, into binding interactions. And on top of that, in a similar way, chemical modifications can also be regulated uh, by force with the same principle, no? as you unfold proteins, you expose briefly side, uh, side chains, and that uh, can regulate the, the actual the, the chemical reactivity of these proteins. You can have PTMs that are, um, that are uh, triggered by force, and that might obviously affect the dynamics of these proteins under force, that might uh, change the interactions of these proteins. So at the end of the day is that we have these kind of three, let's say, ingredients, or these kind of three different molecular mechanisms that obviously they're all related between them, but basically it's to understand uh, these force sensing processes from a molecular perspective, we need to understand how these proteins behave under force, how they interact under force, and how they can uh, be chemically modified um, under force. And from you know, the protein, let's say, perspective, unfortunately, we cannot use uh, classical, let's say, protein biochemistry techniques to study these problems because these proteins are under force. And you cannot, uh, so you need to study them under force, and you cannot do that on a test tube. And here is where, where this set of techniques, the single molecule techniques, I think, become uh, very relevant because actually with single molecule techniques, you can stretch single proteins, you can apply mechanical forces and measure how uh, they respond uh, to them. And in particular, from the three main uh, force spectroscopy techniques, which are AFM, optical tweezers, and magnetic tweezers, uh, we employ magnetic tweezers, we employ and develop um, magnetic tweezers instrumentation. And that is because we think that actually magnetic tweezers from these uh, techniques are particularly appropriate to, to study um, these proteins, basically because magnetic tweezers allow you to apply very low forces, which are uh, on the range of the physiologically relevant forces uh, in, the, in this context, and then it has another advantage, which is you're able to do very long measurements. It's a very stable technique that allows you to track uh, protein dynamics for a very long time. So, I mean, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here talking about the instrumentation, but just for you to get an idea of how magnetic tweezers work, so basically, it's a fairly simple instrument, just requires some bright field microscope and then some way of applying a magnetic field that is calibrated and results in a force. So in magnetic tweezers, you basically have a protein construct, as you are seeing here, that it's anchored to a glass substrate, and the other uh, terminus is anchored to a superparamagnetic bit. So when you apply um, a magnetic field, you will uh, create this pulling force. And then you're applying constant forces, so depending on, you know, uh, how strong this force is, how, how high this force is, proteins can undergo conformational changes and then just by using the microscope you can track very accurately this conformational dynamics simply by looking at the vertical position of the bit. 
And the typical outcome of this experiment is this kind of stochastic trajectory that I'm showing you here, where uh, what you're seeing basically is the folding and unfolding dynamics of a protein. You're measuring the extension of the protein as a function of time. And you have here when the protein has a low extension, the protein is folded, and then um, you have a high extension, the protein is unfolding. And actually, you can learn a lot uh, from these kind of trajectories, but for example, uh, studying the populations, the relative populations, how these populations from fold and unfold it change with force. Uh, and as I was telling you before, one of the advantages of magnetic tweezers is that actually you can measure these dynamics for very long times. For example, what well, this is just an experiment with a model protein that we use sometimes has no relationship with mechanics whatsoever. But basically, you know, you can measure a single protein for days, even and even like characterize all the nanomechanical properties of that protein just by using one single, let's say, protein individual. Okay, so yeah, so I'll, I'll now move to to the to the first story I, I wanted to tell you about where. Um, we focus on, on studying uh, the dynamics of, of mechanosensing proteins by using this technology. So the protein I'm going to start talking about today is tailing, which I was saying before is one of the central proteins of focal adhesion because it has, it's an adapter protein that plays like this cross-linking role, uh, focal adhesion by binding to integrins and actin. And actually, it's a mechanosensitive hub because it has, as you can see here, many different binding partners that interact with it, or with, particularly with the, what's called the tailing rod, which is a mechanosensitive uh, region in tailing. And it has different binding sites. For example, one of the main proteins that interact with it is vinculin. Um, and the, the interesting thing of vinculin is that it binds to cryptic helices along the tailing rod, so are these red helices that I'm showing you here. So basically, if tailing is folded, vinculin won't be able to interact with it. However, if you stretch it, you expose these binding sites, and vinculin um, interacts. And in particular, we've been uh, working for a while on one of the domains from the tailing rod, which is the R3 domain, the third domain uh, along the rod, which is also the... Uh, the one that has the, the lowest mechanical stability. So people you know, have argued that basically it's the first domain that unfolds when you know, recruit the first vinculin and basically it kind of switches this kind of feedback mechanism that increases force, recruits more vinculin, etc. But here, uh, yeah, we studied before like the dynamics of this, uh, of this protein, of this protein domain. Uh, and it seemed like from the, let's say, protein folding perspective, which it's kind of where I come from, uh, we thought that this was like a, a basically like a classic two-state folder in the sense that uh, when you measure its dynamics under force, you basically see this kind of all or none hopping dynamics between the folded state and the unfolded state. And as you can see, actually these, dynamic, these dynamics are exquisitely sensitive to force, only changing force by fraction of a piconewton results in a measurable change in the populations of the folded state. So as you increase force, you obviously favor the unfolded state, if forces are lower. Um, you favor the, 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 the folded state, but the force dependence, let's say, is very sharp, meaning that it only responds to a narrow force range. And we typically think that if you measure a protein that has these properties, basically it's a good force sensor because you can see it as a switch. It's able to detect this range of forces by going from totally folded to totally unfolded. We also studied uh, previously um, vinculin binding to this protein. I'm not going to speak uh, about this today, but just to show that you c we can also measure like binding dynamics to this protein. And basically, as I was saying before, vinculin binds to cryptic sites in tailing. So basically, when the protein is folded, it's, the sites are hidden. When the protein is unfolded here, the sites are exposed. And in the presence of vinculin, what you can see is that eventually, basically, this dynamic uh, stop at some point, and that is, let's say, the fingerprint of a single uh, binding event, no, because as vinculin binds to unfold the tailing, obviously tailing is not able to fold anymore, and we can actually study like how force, let's say, regulates this interaction. But uh, in this story that I'm, I'm telling you, our interest was actually, to, well, it was a really simple question, it was like how, you know, what happens basically if we measure the dynamics of these forces in protein for a very long time. So as I was telling you before, with our, let's say, initial short experiments, we thought that tailing was a classic two-state folder and we had like this classic beautiful dynamics and that was it. But then we started doing like longer experiments and longer experiments with our magnetic tweezers and we realized soon that, it, that the, basically the picture was not so simple. So here I went from a uh, recording of 500 seconds to like a bit over an hour, and you can st already see like you have some kind of weird states that are characterized by a different extension, but they are different from these folded and unfolded dynamics. And as we expanded even more our measuring scale, we actually found out that 
the telling, let's say, conformational landscape was very complex. So as you can see here, after a few hours, telling kind of goes to a totally different conformational, let's say, uh, state, you know, where you have these dynamics that actually trapped the dynamics of the protein for a very long time and then it spontaneously gets back to its folded dynamics, to its you know, a native folding dynamics, and then eventually you, you have a, a different, um, let's say, stochastic uh, transition to a totally different conformational state and then spontaneously goes back to the native folded state. So that was initially, you know, quite shocking because we, we had, you know, we hadn't like seen anything like this for any other protein. And actually after measuring many different tailing proteins, we could uh, kind of rationalize the conformational complexity of, of this tailing protein by finding out that actually it has like, let's say, six different folded, let's say, states. Now the, the first one is the native folding dynamics and we have this other state where suddenly the protein kind of loses mechanical stability because it goes to the unfolded state with very brief transitions to the folded state and then gets back to its folded dynamics. And we have these three and four states where basically the protein gets stuck in some kind of intermediate conformation to then spontaneously escape from it. And then we had this kind of two way more complex state where you can see what you also have like hopping dynamics between states of, of different extensions. And we knew that this was uh, something, let's say, conformational. It was not like a chemical modification that was spontaneously occurring because actually we could rescue these states with mechanical force. So what you're seeing here is that we start with our two-state folding dynamics, then the protein goes to one of these weird states. And if we lower the force, we actually trap the protein in that state. So we did that for two hours and then back to the hopping force and we are still trapped there. But now if we increase the force, we see some kind of conformational change and then the protein is back to its native folded, folding dynamics. So this basically means that with force you could rescue the protein back to unfolded state and therefore to its native folding route. So yeah, so basically when we observed this, we, we wanted to understand what was, you know, what's going on. Can we actually say something about what these states mean? And we started by trying to understand this state number two simply because it was the, you know, apparently it was like the easiest one to interpret because what you have is still you have two state folding dynamics, it's just that the protein like temporarily loses some mechanical stability. And this was something similar to what other people have observed previously with a different protein, uh, and which was related to proline isomerization. So, well, so proline is a very special amino acid because it's a very rigid amino acid and it can be on the cis or the trans conformation and it's an amino acid that typically is placed on loops you know, between helices or between beta sheets and actually uh, this tailing domain has a proline amino acid that it's uh, yeah, the, the proline 881 on one of the loops and this uh, proline is on the cis uh, conformation. So what we thought is that maybe what was happening here simply is that stochastically this proline residue can go to the trans state and the protein is not so happy in this, you know, trans state, so basically loses some mechanical stability, which is what you're seeing here. So this was easy to find out because basically what you do, if you want to prove this hypothesis, you mutate the proline by a glycine residue that doesn't have these dynamics and actually mimics the trans state of the protein. And as you can see here, this mutant where the proline has been substituted by a glycine residue shows you know, a lower mechanical stability similar to the one in the trans state and actually by measuring this mutant also, although we found like all the states that I have shown you previously, we never found this state number two, which was actually telling us that, yeah, this state number two, what we are capturing here is just the disomerization of one of the proline residues. But the rest of the states were a bit more, let's say, complex to understand. So we, you know, if, if you get something like this and you want to picture how does the protein look like in, in, in any of these states, what you will do in principle is basically measure, you know, the extension of these states, take a look at the protein structure and try to guess, you know, more or less if you can find like some kind of reasonable structure that the protein might be adopting here. But then, well, we thought that actually because we're measuring equilibrium dynamics of these proteins, uh, the end-to-end, -end, let's say, extension changes is not the only thing that we can quantify here. There's another uh, thing that we can measure, and that is molecular fluctuations. So the idea, um, I'm just trying to get a polymer <laughs> kind of thing. So basically, yeah, when the protein is folded, no, it's kind of a structure, okay? So it's in some structure state, but when you unfold it, basically it becomes a, an unstructured uh, uh, polypeptide chain that behaves following the rules of simple uh, polymer physics models, okay? So actually the, its average end-to-end -end extension is something that can be predicted very well by models like the Warline chain model or the, or the free jointed chain model, okay? But not only the average end-to-end -end length, it, um, 
follows these polymer models, or also other quantities like the variance of this extension, no? yes, the fluctuations of these extensions. And the fluctuations of, of, this, exten of this extension um, scale inversely proportional with force. No? So if force is very high, the polymer is very stretched, so it's not going to fluctuate much. If force is lower, the fluctuations are going to be higher. And obviously also the magnitude of this fluctuation scale linearly on the contour length of the polymer, how long this, pro this polymer is. So we thought, okay, so what happens if, for example, you have like the protein in this unstructured you know, state and then folded state, and then part of this unstructured state forms, for example, a secondary structure element such as an alpha helix. No? So imagine that half of this polymer becomes an alpha helix now. So now it's a structure. So its extension is not going to change much because an alpha helix is just a bit shorter than the equivalent um, and a structure, let's say, polypeptide. But however, now you're sequestering basically half of this contour length that is not going to be able to fluctuate, to contribute to the fluctuations. So you should actually be able to see that these uh, variants, these fluctuations, have been cut by half in this state. So by combining me you know, measurements of end-to-end -end length with molecular fluctuation, you basically have, like, let's say, more elements to try to understand the dynamics of, this, um, of these states. I'm going to illustrate you with uh, how this method works with this state, no? where what you're seeing is that suddenly the protein is unfolded and then gets stuck in this conformation that is just a tiny bit shorter than the unfolded state, just three nanometers, okay, and then get back to it. So you can measure the end-to-end ex -end extension change, and as I was telling you, the difference between the unfolded state and this H state, I call it H because it's kind of a helical state, is just three nanometers, but however, if you analyze the fluctuations of the native state and folded state in this green state here, you can see that the fluctuations in the green state are half of those in the unfolded state. That is what I'm showing you here. So this means that the protein in this state, half the protein has some kind of a structure and the other half is an structure. So something, for example, like this, no? where half the protein is sequestered in an alpha uh, helical rod, while the rest of the protein is you know, unstructured and therefore um, contributes to these fluctuations. So by using this method, we basically went one by one with all these states. I'm not going to go over every state. But yeah, for example, this uh, state number three, we found that the fluctuations were the same as in the native state, which means that the protein it's, has a, a higher extension. However, it's fully structured because you have no fluctuations, so something like this. And then with this more complicated state, we analyzed the, fluct the combination of end-to-end -end extension changes and fluctuations and proposed, let's say, a structure that at least were compatible with, uh, with our measurements. And therefore, our end goal was to kind of reconstruct the full energy landscape of the protein, which we did by using this kind of kinetic network representation. So remember, if you only measure for a, you know, for a short time scale, you will only be exploring this region, you know, these dynamics between the folded and unfolded state, but actually you have all these other possible conformations and you can measure experimentally the transition rates between its um, conformation and therefore reconstruct the full um, uh, energy landscape of the protein. Similar to, for example, what people that work in molecular dynamics do with their simulation, this kind of Markov state model networks, uh, but here uh, experimentally. And uh, yeah, so we also wanted to explore if there was like some biological meaning, let's say, to this state. So we decided, okay, let's try to see what happens if you add vinculin and if these states are able to recruit vinculin or not. And the answer is that most of these states actually block, let's say, tailings main function, which is to recruit vinculin. So stochastically, here the protein went to this state number five. We added uh, vinculin. We waited for an hour and we saw nothing. Basically, the protein was still stuck in this state, then you rescue it back to its native folding dynamics and you get vinculin binding. So actually this uh, state, which you might call like misfolded conformations if you want, actually are, um, let's say, blocking one of Taylor's main function, which is to recruit vinculin. Uh, yeah, and basically, yeah, the take home message, um, the way I like to picture is that, I mean, it's kind of a very simple concept from, from, from equilibrium sampling you know, in physics. If you sample dynamics for a short time scale, you're basically, you might be exploring only like a local equilibrium, no? you're, because you only can, let's say, track dynamics uh, that involve a short energy barrier. But however, as you extend the measuring time scale, you gain access to more, more remote regions of the free energy landscape of these proteins, because you can overcome uh, higher energy barriers and actually be able to, you know, to reconstruct the full um, energy landscape of the protein. Can you just ask something very briefly? Yeah, yeah. So you had at some point also the probability of being in one state versus the other one fraction, I think you called it, right? It's a function of force. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's a very steep transition? I mean, is it the design principle behind it from biology perspective 
to give one the sharp transition, or would you rather have something graded? Uh, I'm not sure so familiar how to interpret it. Is yeah. No, so I think for, for, I mean, at least the way I see it or the way I interpret it, like proteins that have like a force sensing function, you want to SERP for dependency. Like sort of a high hill coefficient, if you would think of it in terms of. Yeah. Like you want something very, very narrow so that it's able, let's say, to, you know, undergo a conformational transition at one force and not have like this shallow, let's say, dependence where, mm -hmm. you know, you might have mixed populations over a broad range of forces. But if it's then sort of very sharp and very cooperative, let's say, is mm -hmm. a binding or supporting event, because I know you would also imagine the switching is getting slower and slower and so more complicated it gets. Mm. So, so <coughs> but I guess it's what you're seeing slightly as an immediate state as well. Yeah. So like how how yeah, how sharp or not sharp this curve is, which is the equilibrium uh, let's say population, no the, the fraction of, of folded state. It's not always directly related to how quick the transitions are. Like sometimes you have proteins that are really slow, you have a high energy barrier, but maybe but the force dependence might be very sharp or very shallow. So that's like two separate things. Yeah. So here, yeah, I didn't explain this because so just. But yeah, we, if you measure rates, you can measure how this. You know, this is a folding rate which decreases with force, and this is a folding rate that increases with force exponentially. Uh, and you know, the time scale that you have here depends on every protein. And it's not directly related to either the force range over which it uh, responds or how sharp this is. Yeah, no, I mean, that was appropriate because I was going to change to the to the second story, which is not related at all with this. And um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so the second story is actually, uh, it's work in progress. So it's uh, a project that I we basically started like uh, less than a year ago with my first PhD student, so you know it's still not finished, and there are still like some little gaps. But uh, I think it's, you know already we have so, like some nice data to 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 tell you uh, a story. And it, this is this one is more related to how chemical modifications impact uh, protein dynamics and interactions. So yeah, so something that we wanted to look at it's how post-relational modifications can affect the behavior of proteins under force. No? So as, as probably most of you know, so, well, post-relational modifications are one of the ways proteins have to modulate its function or it, you know, its behavior in a dynamic way. And it involves the, you know, the addition of a chemical group to the side chain of some amino acids. There are many different kinds of post-relational modifications that target different amino acids. For example, we have oxidation that uh, typically targets cysteines and methionine. We have phosphorylation that targets uh, tyrosines, ser uh, serines, threonines, et cetera, et cetera. And in the sense of how PTMs, let's say, uh, relate uh, to proteins under force, most, most of the work that has been done, it's, it's been focused on one protein in particular that is not at focal adhesion, it's titin, which is one of the three filaments in the muscle. You know, so it's actually the largest protein in our body. And there is a lot of beautiful work uh, using single molecule techniques that explores the role of oxidative modifications in titin particularly of cysteines. And that is very relevant for, for in the muscle con context because uh, reactive oxygen species or oxi oxidative stress are physiologically very relevant for, for muscle function. But however, in the, in the context of proteins, uh, you know, force sensing proteins at structure like focal adhesions, there's not a lot, at least from the molecular perspective, of how PTMs can actually regulate the behavior of these proteins. And that's something that we wanted to look at and be, because at the end of the day, focal adhesions are, let's say, signaling halves in the, in the, in, in the sense that, uh, yeah, they are converting forces to signaling um, events. There is one uh, post-relational modification that becomes obvious to explore, and that is obviously phosphorylation, no? because phosphorylation is probably the main uh, signaling event in biology, and actually it's a very common PTM. Over one-third of our proteome is phosphorylated at some point. And from the chemical perspective, that involves the addition of a phosphate group to the to hydroxyl group in the side chain of uh, either serine, threonine, or tyrosine, although histidine can also be phosphorylated. And uh, yeah, we it's often like you, you have like this kind of textbook kind of picture where phosphorylation, it's a key event that basically activates or inactivates a protein. And it's a, a, and it's a PTM that is made, it's an enzymatic PTM, which means that you need a kinase enzyme to transfer this phosphate group. But 
I mean, we, I mean, the way, with the way we, uh, we work, basically, we want to understand, like, from a mechanistic perspective, like how this, you know, how phosphorylation, let's say, uh, modulates uh, the protein. Because at the end of the day, you're adding not only a bulky group, but you're also adding negative charge to a protein. So you could expect that proteins might undergo some conformational change upon phosphorylation. And in particular, if you're measuring uh, the pro dynamics of a protein under force, you could expect that these dynamics should be, uh, you know, altered in some way. Uh, if a protein uh, becomes phosphorylated. And this, uh, and not only this, but also something that we were interested in, 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 in thinking about is whether actually mechanical forces can also regulate the currents of phosphorylation modification through this mechanism that I was explaining at the beginning. No? Just by exposing uh, previously cryptic side chains, you might regulate the chemical reactivity of these proteins. And that question was partially inspired by some uh, previous work that has been done uh, from a cellular perspective on, 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 the on the role of phosphorylation in focal adhesions, particularly, for example, this paper by the Mike Seed lab, where they basically demonstrated that one protein focal adhesion, which is CAS120, uh, becomes phosphorylated upon mechanical stimulation of the cell. And the picture that they were proposing is that this protein has a large uh, unstructured region in the protein. So when you apply mechanical force, basically you expose uh, sites uh, that can become susceptible to uh, phosphorylation. There is also other uh, evidence that uh, says that the phosphorylation levels of proteins of focal adhesion uh, increase uh, upon mechanical stimulation with cells. So there seems to be like some kind of connection between force and, and, and phosphorylation uh, uh, in proteins of focal adhesions. And then if you want to study phosphorylation and focal adhesion proteins, there is a very obvious candidate that you want to look at, and that is the focal adhesion kinase, which uh, it's a very important protein in focal adhesions, and as its name says, it's a kinase itself, so it's an enzyme, it's a tyrosine kinase, so it's an enzyme that actually phosphorylates different proteins at focal adhesions, and actually it also uh, autophosphorylates itself. Uh, so structurally, this protein has an N-terminal domain that binds to the membrane, although it's not clear whether it can interact as well with integrins, it is a firm domain. Then you have the kinase domain, which is the catalytic domain, a long unstructured region, and the C-terminal domain is the FAT domain, the um, focal adhesion targeting domain, which is the domain that it's a mechanosensitive domain that is also responsible uh, for locating this protein to focal adhesions. And that is because this domain interacts with paxillin, which is another relevant focal adhesion protein. So it's also a protein that is under mechanical force because things like this N-terminal region will be by the membrane and the C-terminal region will be, you know, more in, what's about interacting with paxillin, and it has different uh, phosphorylation sites. Some of these sites uh, are autophosphorylated by its kinase domain, and other sites are phosphorylated with, uh, by another kinase, which is SRC, which is another relevant kinase, uh, kinase that gets um, recruited to focal adhesions. And in particular, we were interested in this domain, the FAT domain, because it's a mechanosensitive domain, and it has a phosphorylation site, this uh, tyrosine 925, that it's phosphorylated by SRC. And the picture that what happens, the, the picture that people think is that upon phosphorylation, basically, what happens is that paxillin binding is blocked. So paxillin cannot bind anymore to the phosphorylated FAT domain. And therefore, that is an event that triggers uh, focal adhesion disassembly, basically. Focal, uh, FAC will go away from focal adhesions, and that is something that uh, drives, for example, cell protrusion, cell migration, etc. So we started like looking at this, um, at this protein, and we found some kind of intriguing work, like biochemistry work, where people had tried to phosphorylate, by the way, this is the FAT domain, it's also a four helical bundle, not very different from the structure of tailing, and this is the, um, the tyrosine 125. So people have tried to study from a biochemistry perspective the phosphorylation of this, uh, of this uh, tyrosine. And well, these are not very intuitive uh, plots from this paper, but Basically, what you're seeing is that here they were incubating no, the, the FAT domain with SRC and trying to measure the levels of phosphorylation. And basically, this means that at neutral pH, you have almost no phosphorylation. And if you decrease the pH a bit, you have a bit more phosphorylation, but it's still like less than 5% of the proteins were phosphorylated. And that might suggest that perhaps there is some conformational change that allows phosphorylation. However, if you use a peptide, basically you chop this helix and just put that helix in solution with SRC, phosphorylation levels increase by 34. So you have a lot of phosphorylation. So it's not that SRC is not very good at phosphorylating this one. This protein is basically that when the protein is folded, SRC is not very good at phosphorylating this protein. And that was basically the conclusion of this paper. And well, since this protein is under mechanical force, 
we thought, okay, so maybe that's actually, you know, a good candidate to explore if actually mechanical forces can help or can regulate the phosphorylation of this protein site, no? Because upon, you know, mechanical stretching, this protein will unfold, and then basically you will be in the, a similar situation, let's say, to this peptide experiment where this tyrosine is exposed. Uh, what happened? Okay, yeah. Okay, so that was our uh, initial hypothesis, and then, well, we started... Uh, to study this protein, and always the first experiment that you do um, with, with, with any protein is just trying to measure its force dependency. So we built a construct for our magnetic tweezers that allow us to, to, to measure the dynamics of this protein. And basically that's, you know, how this protein responds to force. So it's not, I mean, if you see this trace, probably you'll think, oh, it's the same as tailing, but the force here is a bit lower. And also if you look at the time scale, it's a protein whose dynamics are much lower than those of tailing. Tailing basically has a transition every second, more or less. And this one, it's more every 10, 20 seconds that you, you see a transition, so it's much lower. And then, yeah, we characterized uh, this protein. Basically, the first thing you do is to measure how this step size is changed with force, and simply that is because you want to make sure that what you're measuring is your protein. No? So you fit it to the wall line chain, you get a contour length of around 40 nanometers that matches the number of amino acids in this protein. So, yeah, okay, the dynamics we're observing is actually folded to unfolded transitions. Rates as a function of force and the folding probability, and again, here we're seeing this thing that we were mentioning before. It's a protein that has a quite sharp force dependency, so dynamics of a good uh, force sensor. And not related to the project at all, but also we have some weird states on this protein when you measure for a long time. They are different from those in tailing, but it's interesting that we also found this kind of behavior in, in this protein. Uh, yeah, and then as I was saying, um, this domain is responsible of locating um, FAC2 focal adhesions by interacting with Paxilin. So Paxilin is a protein that I think its N-terminal region is an interaction hub and interact with tailing, binquine, with many different proteins. And it does so with some what's called the LD motif, which are some short helical motifs rich in leucine and aspartic. I always mix the, <laughs> the yeah, so basically uh, interact with hydrophobic patches in proteins. And particularly, the, it has five LD motifs, Paxilin, and two of them, LD2 and LD4, interact uh, with FAT. So it has one binding site here for LD2, one binding site here between helices 2 and 3, for the LD4, and that is the crystal structure of FAT bound to both um, Paxilin, uh, you know, LD motifs. So uh, biochemistry experiments have suggested that this is a cooperative interaction in the sense that the affinity of one peptide for FAT is not very large, but however, if you put both at the same time, this affinity is much uh, higher, it's increased by about tenfold. So we wanted not to study its affinity, but to study its affinity, let's say, under force. And to do that, we started by doing some molecular dynamic simulations just to understand the mechanics of, this, um, of these interactions. And in these simulations, simply what we're doing is starting from the crystal structure of FAT bound to the Paxilin uh, peptide, pull from the protein and from the peptide and see what's the force you need to unbind no? this complex. And we did that for the LD2 domain, for the LD4 domain, and then for both at the same time. And we kind of got the same result that was uh, demonstrated biochemically. Basically, we have cooperative unbinding. Both, you know, peptides unbind simultaneously, and they do that at a much higher force than if you have just only one of the domains. No? So basically, the simulations initially suggested that we have some kind of cooperative mechanism here, also uh, when this protein is, is mechanically stretched. And then we wanted to study this... Um, from a single molecule perspective. Uh, so binding experiments in single molecules are always tricky because if you imagine if you're forming a complex and you're pulling, when you pull basically what happens is that you lose the complex. So you, you know it's a problem because you cannot basically uh, monitor like reversible binding dynamics if you're just pulling from one uh, complex to the other. But some people um, have thought of this uh, like kind of, I think it's a very clever um, protein construct that basically you can get, let's say your substrate protein your binder, and then simply connect them with some uh, unstructured linker. So this is a single polypeptide chain where you have your substrate and your peptide connected by an, by a, by an unstructured linker. So at low forces, this will be you know, bound, and then you will have a short extension. But if you increase force, you can trigger the unbinding, you know, which will result in the stretching. So you will see some kind of a step. But because these two proteins are linked by this linker, it's a reversible process. So you can measure reversible binding and binding dynamics, and obviously if you keep increasing force, you can also uh, unfold, for example, your substrate um, uh, protein. 
So with this, uh, so then, yeah, we designed some initial um, uh, magnetic tweezer construct that involved the FAT domain and just the LD2 uh, paxillin peptide. And we put them in our tweezers and we basically to, to see what force uh, was this complex uh, able to resist, similar to the molecular dynamic simulations. Basically what we saw is that this complex is really weak, so it, it unbinds at very low forces. So you will have to believe me because it's very noisy, but here we have binding and unbinding events. And we know this because then the contour length of the protein increases by 25 nanometers, which is what you would expect uh, given the size I mean, the length of this linker, but the unbinding forces were very low, so something around 3.5 piconewton when pulling at one piconewton per second. We could also measure binding, reversible binding and binding dynamics just by going to a constant force and looking at the dynamics. Again, this is very noisy and it's very close to our resolution limit, but still we are able to monitor individual binding and binding transitions. So here, basically, on this purple state, the complex is bound, is formed, and then for example, here in this orange, these spikes here, you are single unbinding events. As you increase force, you have coexistence between both states, but this is on a millisecond scale, so it's very close to our resolution limit. And if we increase more the force, then obviously we favor the unbound state and we have just some very brief binding events. And this is the probability of unbinding as a function of force with a, you know, the, uh, the midpoint more or less at 3.5 piconewton. However, then we did experiments, we did another construct that involved both peptides okay, connected by a linker, both between the protein and the first peptide, but also between the both peptides, just so it has some slack uh, to bind. And we put it in our tweezers, and here we found that actually this mechanical stability increased, you know, significantly. Now, you don't have to believe me. You can see here that you have reversible binding and binding transitions as you keep increasing force, and now we have an increase in contour length of about 33 nanometers, which makes sense because now the linker is longer. And then the binding forces now have increased uh, up to five piconewtons. So we are kind of seeing this cooperative uh, binding that uh, was suggested before. And these are uh, constant force experiments where you have reversible binding and binding events that allow us again to characterize both the rates of binding and binding and also the, the, the binding probability. Yeah, so, but, well, that's the comparison between both that basically manifests this uh, cooperative binding effect um, when you have both peptides. But yeah, as I was saying at the beginning, the real motivation of this project was to see whether we could like study the phosphorylation of this uh, tyrosine. Uh, and basically to benchmark or to build some expectation on the behavior of this, uh, of this protein, we started again by doing some molecular dynamic simulations sim simply because it's easier to phosphorylate a protein in silicon. You just have to modify the side chain of this amino acid and run your simulations and see basically what happens. So we initially just ran some you know, equilibrium simulations, long dynamic simulation, one microsecond, five replicas. And what we found was nothing really interesting. Basically, the protein remains stable, which probably is also not very surprising. However, its RMSD increases a, a bit, which means that probably there's like some confirmation or rearrangement in the protein compared to the unphosphorylated one. But because we, you know, we're a mechanics lab, so we want to study mechanics, then we did some pooling simulations just to unfold the protein, starting with a non-phosphorylated protein. And these are SMD simulations well, what we see is that this protein breaks, uh, the unfolding pathway of these proteins involves uh, two rupture events, one that takes the protein to this state, basically you are uncoiling the helices one and four and kind of leaving the core of the protein intact, and then you have a second um, rupture event that you know, leads the protein to its fully stretched uh, form, and these two peaks basically have a comparable uh, force. However, when we ran these simulations with the phosphorylated protein, we saw that it was the unfolding pathway was actually quite different. Basically, you were losing this um, first rupture event, so the protein was going almost with no resistance to this state that basically involves uh, the first helix of the protein, the one that contains the phosphorylated tyrosine. It's unraveled, like almost with no uh, mechanical resistance, and then the rest of the protein uncoils. So the protein, first, is losing some mechanical stability, and second, seems to be having this kind of intermediate state where this helix uncoils quite easily. So then we went to the, to the lab, and we saw um, if we could actually phosphorylate this protein uh, using our magnetic tweezer. So our first experiment was basically kind of reproducing these biochemistry experiments where you basically incubate your FAT protein with a kinase and a kinase buffer, incubate it 24 hours, and then instead of doing like mass spec or 
uh, phosphorylation detection techniques, we use our magnetic tweezers to fingerprint proteins because we understand very well how the non-phosphorylated protein uh, behaves. And what we saw the next morning when we measured many of these proteins actually was nothing. The protein had the same behavior that we have you know, observed uh, thus far. The, you know, two-state dynamics or a similar range of forces. So it's actually, this was kind of corroborating these biochemistry experiments. If the protein is folded in a test tube in the presence of the enzyme, you really don't get much phosphorylation or you don't get phosphorylation at all. So then we did experiments under force where basically you start your experiment, you have your hopping dynamics, the protein is happy and then at the middle of the experiment you do a buffer exchange and you uh, add your kinase on, on this kinase buffer. Okay, and then we waited a few minutes and then we observed that something happened. The protein kind of changed behavior and you can see that now it's kind of stuck in this unfolded conformation, which is a signature that, you know, something happened and that's not related to this conformational state because this state cannot be recovered by force. And actually if you lower the force by a bit more than one piconewton, then you recover folding, this folding dynamics, but however, a lot lower force, so the protein had lost some mechanical stability and also faster kinetics. So we've, you know, we did, we've done like quite a few experiments this way and we also always observe that uh, upon addition of the kinase, something happens in the protein and remember that here the protein is exploring the unfolded states. So actually, um, we're using force to trigger this chemical modification. But on not, not only the loss in mechanical stability, we also saw that the let's say folding pathway of the protein had, you know, changed completely. And now we no longer had this two-state folding dynamics. Now we have an intermediate state that was not observed before, and that is this green state that you can see here, okay? And it's a proper intermediate state in the sense that the protein to go from folded to unfolded has to stop by this intermediate state. So you have sometimes have transitions between folded to intermediate, back to folded. Sometimes you have transitions from unfolded to intermediate and back to unfolded. Or sometimes you have the full transition where the protein from folded goes through intermediate and unfolds. And if you measure, let's say, from your experiments, the, you know, how, you know, what kind of a structure would it make sense in this intermediate state, both using this fluctuation analysis and also the end-to-end -end extension changes, actually the protein should look something like this, very similar to that intermediate state that we were seeing in the molecular dynamic simulations where the first helix is unraveled no, and the rest of the protein remains folded. Yeah, so what we've done thus far is basically to, you know, characterize the mechanics of, of this interaction as you, uh, and of this, uh, mod of this modified, of this force-related protein. And as you see, the protein loses some mechanical stability. You lose about one piconewton and then you create this intermediate state. And that is where we are at now. And obviously we have, let's say, two key experiments that we need to do. The main question is whether we can actually see that phosphorylation blocks paxilin binding. So we have this paxilin um, binding assay. So the idea is to uh, phosphorylate FAT in this construct and then measure the binding dynamics to see if actually it's blocking. And then let's say the dream experiment is if we can actually reverse the phosphorylation modification by adding a phosphatase when this modification has happened and therefore the protein should go back to, let's say, its native folding dynamics. But that's basically the, the, the experiments that, that we're missing at the moment. And yeah, I think with this, um, um, at the end of my talk, I just well, some acknowledgement. So, well, that's my mentor, Julio Fernandez, with whom I did my, my postdoc in, in New York, and we did together all this uh, instrumental development. And the first project I told you about uh, was also done with uh, Mark Mora, a postdoc at Sergi's lab. And then all the second story um, has been led by Greta, which is my, my, my PhD student. So we've done a, quite an impressive um, work, and then, yeah, some funders, and yeah, that's it. So, thank you. There's, well, in vitro, yes, there are some crystal structure with dimerizes, but in the cell, it apparently, it binds paxlin. You have, like, single tethered proteins. So there's no effect of multiplication at all for that? No, particular for this protein, I think not. 
first part of the talk you were talking about the uh, role of fluctuations to understand the uh, mm -hmm. configuration, but you also can look at the at the duration of the dual time, the probability of the distributions. Are they just boring exponentials or there is something fancier? Boring exponentials, yeah. But that, this, this rate that I'm showing you here is that, is the transition between its conformation and, yeah, it's boring exponentials, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, so it's then such a powerful tool if that is an extra dynamic tool for things. Uh, when you study the dynamic tool challenge, so I noticed that you uh, use the magnetic freezer to, uh, like, apply the force and level less than 10 kilograms. Mm -hmm. However, in fact, the focal diffusion, when the focal diffusion forms, the cell can produce force level like uh, as high as to, as I know, 54 um, so I, I mean, I think what's thought is that, I mean, this was done with some FRET sensors, and I think the force along tailing in focal adhesions, the average one is between 7 and 10 piconewton although transiently can go to 15. I think the 54 number, I think probably that's interaction integrating fibronectin, I think. You know, that, that force, I think, is, is higher. But like from FRET uh, sensors, I think it's thought that forces across tailing are in the range <laughs> of around 10 piconewton at most. Okay. Not at most, on average. And then some like... Oh, you mean the force actually applied to tailing is only at a level of like 57? 7 to 10, I think, is the number that... Okay, More force, yes, yes, yes. So this is because I have a second question, sorry. No, no, it's uh, fine. In terms of the force level you apply by the magnetic, my magnetic freezer, have you tried or have you thought about to, uh, to change the force level to be the force loading rate? Because now mm -hmm. people in the mechanics, they have the tools. No, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. Yeah, we can, and actually, I, I, I mean, I didn't explain them much, but we can do, um, for example, like these binding experiments, they're done at one piconewton per second. So you ramp the force, okay? You ramp the force linearly, and then you observe transitions, and you measure at what force do these transitions occur. And, and typically we use like this, yes, which is close to the physiological. No, I mean here, because you're ramping up the force, basically you trigger a transition and then you keep an increasing force so you don't observe like any more transitions. So here the outcome of this experiment basically is like at what force, you know, this protein un unfolds. So for example, here you're seeing the unfolding of the FAT domain, no? this, so this is force and this is extension of your construct. And here you're seeing that forces of around 11 piconewton unfolds the protein at this pulling rate. If you pull faster, these forces will increase. If you pull it slower, the closer you're like to the equilibrium situation, the more similar the behavior will be to the, you know, constant force experiment. So basically it's like, you know, if you're really out of equilibrium, all this goes to higher forces. So very nice talk. So you have these relatively sharp transitions you showed, you talked about it earlier, mm -hmm. right? a few pickle. Yeah. Um, it corresponds to a few miles in effectively, right? Um, one miles in is roughly one pickle newton pulling, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. But then, so that looks like a very sharp transition, but then on the other hand, you know, in the beginning you talked about cells on different substrates, they have very different morphologies and so on. So apparently at some point, you know, at an emergent level, you have different types of behavior coming out of it. Mm -hmm. So how, how would you, how would you describe this, um, at what level does it happen, um, that sort of graded response? Is it at a gene regulatory level or, I don't know, more complicated of these I mean, yeah, I mean, translating like, you know, single molecule, let's say, experiments to cells is not always straightforward because, yeah, yeah sure. you, know, you have like many proteins interacting and it might be complicated to really, uh, you know, correlate, let's say, this, this finding to what happens uh, at the cellular level. So, I mean, Maybe it's a tendency to go from one to two molecules, or is yeah. that sort of a big step? No, I mean, th there's people that have been, you know, doing experiments with two molecules in parallel. And I mean, in my opinion, there's nothing too interesting there. It's just basically everything scales by two, no? So you have increased in forces. I mean, here I think the inspiration for, for this, um, you know, or 
you know, the motivation of this experiment is that, you know, trying to see that actually you do have like this kind of single protein tethers in the cell in some way. Obviously, everything is like clustered and everything, but at the end of the day, these proteins are actually like a stretch, let's say, between its termini. So this experiment, in a way, they're mimicking that pooling geometry, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I mean, what, 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 what we chose basically was the same geometry that we had for the experiment. Okay. So we were here in the experiment, I think this is the N-terminus, the protein, and the C-terminus is the peptide. So we basically, you know, take the, you know, one protein, you know, the full protein and the peptide and pull like this, to, you know, try to mimic the same geometry. Orientation, you mean? Yeah, like if you just pull in a, if you just pull For example, if you like, pull, if you pull it like this. If you just no, it around. yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Probably the pulling geometry is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if you like switch the peptide, I think that's not the right binding site. <laughs> so because we're using like the crystal structures for 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 this. So basically, here we're pulling. All well, these arrows are not very well put, but basically you're pulling here and here, and seeing what force you need. Like again, what inspired by the you know, but that's actually, I mean, this is, um, you know, this, this is a C-terminal domain of the protein, so, you know, it kind of makes sense that force is being applied like this. But obviously, if you try to pull like this, for example, probably the forces will be different. I mean, we know that uh, pulling geometry matters for, for uh, protein mechanical stability. Like, the pulling axis can change totally the mechanical stability of a protein.